And now please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we get the chance to wrap up the sermon series that I have been preaching on God. It's hard to believe, but Lent is quickly coming to a close. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. Holy Week is, without a doubt, my favorite time of the year. But before we get there, before we walk with Jesus to Jerusalem and the cross, we get to think deeply on the nature of God once more. As I've said each week, this sermon series is designed to give you the framework to think about God in the 21st century. How can you make sense of God today? How can you have the tools to talk to others about God? I began this sermon series with a close look at process theology. Process theology views all of reality as a series of discrete moments of what are called actual occasions. Process theology claims that there are no stable essences. Everything is in flux in the process of becoming. God is the source of novelty in the world, that which leads to creativity in each actual occasion. And because God is involved in every moment, God also absorbs whatever happens into God's self. God truly is in all things and also beyond all things. God doesn't control events, but lures each actual occasion towards love, wholeness, and novelty. The next week, I looked at Christian existentialism. This perspective turns away from metaphysical speculation and looks instead at the human condition. The central question for our lives is, how do we have the courage to be ourselves? We are assaulted on all sides by various forms of anxiety, various pressures that lead us to be divided from our essential selves. We confront the limits of our bodies and of fate. We face the ultimate limitation in death. We struggle with guilt and shame and are left searching for meaning in a world with few clear answers. Sometimes these threats are sufficient to destroy our very being. And yet, in spite of these threats to ourselves, we somehow find that courage to be. Part of that comes from support from family and friends. But there's something else as well. God, who is being itself and the very ground of our being, affirms us in who we are and gives us that courage to be. If you want to find God, Look closely at the human condition. The following week, we looked at personal idealism. Now, since the early 20th century, philosophers and intellectuals have argued for a thoroughgoing materialist viewpoint. All that is in the world is atoms and particles. The interactions of those atoms and particles explain all that is. But this perspective, which we often take for granted, overlooks one key fact about life. We only know about our world through our minds. Our minds, our perception, is the way that we know the world. Idealists argue that our primary frame of reference should not be a reductive materialism, but instead the mind. It is our perception, our ideas, which are first and foremost. Personal idealism posits that our minds and our ideas have their source in God, who is the ultimate mind of the universe. The universe comes into being because it first existed in the mind of God. Then last week, we looked at the intersection of science and religion. Religious people often claim that religion and science are non-overlapping magisteria. Religion has its own questions and its own way of evaluating truth claims. Science has its own questions and its own way of evaluating truth claims. Science cannot disprove religion because God is not an object, not a being alongside other beings. But this perspective, this non-overlapping magisteria, does not satisfy everyone. 
Theologians have wondered, can we fit God into a framework that makes sense with science? Do these two have to be entirely separated into non-overlapping spheres? And if they're not, what might it look like, or how, what, how might we justify it? This is where the science of emergence comes into play. Emergentists argue that a reductive materialism is not the best way to explain the universe. Instead, what we see when we look at the universe are increasing levels of complexity. Increasing levels that are more than the sum of their parts. And in the higher levels, they exhibit top-down causation. When subatomic particles come together, they form electrons, neutrons, and protons. Those are more than the sum of their parts. The same is true for when molecules come together to form life and human consciousness. If science exhibits those characteristics, if increasing levels of complexity lead to categorically different things, then it is possible that a higher level exists beyond human consciousness. It is possible that God is the result of the sum of the universe. Woo! It's been quite a few weeks <laughs> of heavy thinking, wouldn't you say? But after all of that theorizing, today we arrive at a place that is far simpler, but no less profound. Today we take a different approach altogether as we tackle the nature of God. I'd like now to focus on the experience of the divine itself, that raw datum upon which all else is built. How can we talk about the experience of God? To help us, I will turn to the great 20th century German scholar, Rudolf Otto, and his landmark book, The Idea of the Holy. Otto begins by differentiating between what he calls the rational and the non-rational. We all have experiences of the world. Every day and every moment, our senses absorb the world around us. And then, our brains analyze our experiences and put them into a rational framework, usually without even thinking about it. You look and perceive a glass in front of you. At first, you see an object, an object that is translucent and that has a particular form. Your brain takes that experience and then automatically tells you, oh, it's a glass. There's the non-rational or pre-rational experience of the object. And then there's the rational analysis that tells you, hey, it's a glass. Now, since your brain knows what a glass is, you might instinctively put water into it or do something else with the glass. But that's based on that rational framework. Before that, it's merely an object whose wavelengths of light and color we perceive. Now, the same thing holds true with our experiences of the divine. We experience something. We experience something when we come in contact with the divine. And then our rational brains do their best to make sense of that experience, to analyze it and put it into a framework that makes sense given our knowledge of the world. All theology, all religions, are rational meditations on the nature of the divine experience. From our perception of the divine, we extrapolate what God is and then build a vocabulary that attempts to make sense of that experience. Now, what fascinated Rudolf Otto was that first non-rational or pre-rational experience of the divine. What can we say about it? How would we describe it if we stepped outside our accepted notions of God? What is the essence of that experience of the divine? Otto found that there were no acceptable terms to describe that experience of the divine. Holy, probably the closest term we have, simply doesn't capture it. We need a word that can express the overabundance of the experience. Otto proposed using the Latin word numen, which means divine presence, but which also points to so much more. And what that more exactly is was the subject of Otto's book. Otto used a Latin phrase that he thought captured the experience of the Newman 
across different cultures and religions and ages. He wrote that our experience of Newman is mysterium tremendum. When someone enters into the divine presence, there is a fear, a tremor that is associated with it. Otto links this fear with the sense of the eerie that we experience when, say, we're listening to a ghost story. Our skin gets cold. There's a sense of weirdness in the face of demonic dread. This fear, historically, was most closely associated with evil spirits. But there is an element of it, according to Otto, in all experiences of the divine. Even as our concept of the divine has evolved over time, we still need to name the element of fear, of overarching awe. In the Old Testament, it's often described as the so-called wrath of God. Otto points out that the wrath of God, when it appears in the Old Testament, is not always or even usually associated with punishment for some transgression. The wrath of God describes the nature of God, not insofar as God is vengeful, but as a constituent element of the divine presence. When people have have described God, they have to name the tremor, the fear, that cold feeling. Even if you want, justifiably, to toss out the wrath of God, you should still acknowledge the tremendum aspect of the Newman that gave rise to those words. The Newman, the divine presence, also has the character of magitas, of majesty. Newman is overwhelming. In the face of the divine, we feel ourselves swallowed up. The I, the ego, disappears in the face of the overpowering nature of God. This is one thing that mystics have attested to time and again. In the presence of Newman, we are nothing. God, the divine presence, overwhelms us with God's majesty. Newman, the divine presence, is also characterized by energy, passion, This is an element of the tremendum in the experience. When people have an experience of God, they name that energy. They say God is the living God, something that is real and vital. God is not about philosophical ruminations. God is not distant or an idea. When you confront the Newman, you see it as anything but static. That is why people have described God as the Almighty, It's not a statement about divine omnipotence. It's a reaction to being in the presence of God. Power, energy are defining elements of that experience. Now, in addition to the tremendum of God, we also experience the mysterium, the mystery of God. The Newman strikes us as wholly other. We don't have sufficient categories or reference points to describe the Newman. The experience is unlike anything else that you know from other parts of your life. You might try to use analogies. You grope for the right words, but they elude you. In the face of the Newman, you experience stupor. You don't know what to make of it. It is mysterium. It is because of this that some theologians turn to the so-called apophatic approach to God. They explain God not by saying what God is, but by saying what God is not. You define God by the very absence of the words that can describe the experience. This is similar to the Buddhist notion of, of the divine experience as void or nothingness. It's not that the Newman is nothing, but that it stands somehow over and different and other than being. This mysterium tremendum has a deep fascination for us. We're instinctively drawn to it. People devise rituals and incantations to try to capture it. Otto writes, but the process does not rest there. Possession of and by the Newman becomes an end in and of itself. It begins to be sought for its own sake. And the wildest and most artificial methods of asceticism are put into practice in order to attain it 
In a word, the vita religiosa, the religious life, begins. And to remain in these strange and bizarre states of numinous possession becomes a good in itself, even a way of salvation, wholly different from the profane good pursued by means of magic. Here, too, commences the process of development by which the experience is matured and purified, till finally it reaches its consummation in the sublimest and purest states of life within the spirit and in the noblest mysticism. Widely various as these states are in themselves, yet they have this element in common, that in them the mysterium is experienced in its essential, positive, and specific character as something that it bestows on man beatitude beyond compare but one whose real nature he can neither proclaim in speech nor conceive in thought, but may know only by direct and living experience. Let that sink in. I wanted to quote that at length to give you an idea of Otto's prose. Union with the Newman, seeking after the Newman, becomes a form of salvation itself. Otto goes on to write about the necessary process of schematization that occurs out of these numinous experiences. These experiences have value and content. They point to a moral order in the universe that is found in the, inter, in the interpenetration between the non-rational and the rational. Humans try to make sense of the Newman. Then they continually refine their insights through reason. But always that reason and insight is fed by the numinous experiences themselves. Religion goes wrong, according to Otto, when religious people lose sight of the source of their religion. Religion becomes watered down to, to simply a series of moral codes or religious practices that are divorced from the numinous. And there's nothing more stale in religion than just a series of do's and don'ts. Religion will continually die and become irrelevant without the return to or the lifting up of the numinous. We see analogies to the numinous in our experience of art and music. Art and music are the closest we can get to capturing it. That is why religious people have put so much energy into art and particularly into architecture over the years. How can you build a sanctuary that speaks to the numinous as you experience it? If you do it well, when it is done well, the sanctuary itself can remind someone of the numinous and even evoke it. Darkness, silence, liturgy, sacred music, the stuff of religion is there and should be there to bring us back to that core of the non-rational experience of the numinous. Now, our text for this morning is a quintessential passage in the Hebrew Bible that describes or attempts to describe the numinous. Here in Isaiah 6, God is full of majesty, energy, and power. The presence of God literally fills the room. You cannot help but be awestruck by the scene. The seraph's presence and speech reinforces this holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. God's glory fills the whole earth, they proclaim. In the face of such an overpowering presence, Isaiah can't help but utter, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Here Isaiah is not lamenting his sins, but when he stands in the presence of the divine, he can't help but feel unworthy. This, according to Rudolf Aldo, is the nature of sin, it's not about violating a moral code, but that sense of impurity in comparison to the divine. Isaiah immediately has a desire to be made clean. He seeks atonement, not for his sins, but so that he can stand in the presence of God. He must be purified. The scene evokes the sense of tremendum. There's a fear present in this text. The fear that comes upon Isaiah in the presence of the divine. God here is wholly other. Words and descriptions fail Isaiah. And he does his best to give words to the indescribable. 
And this scene is also the source of his calling to be a prophet. Isaiah hears a voice, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And in response to this numinous presence of God, Isaiah replies, here I am. Send me. This experience launches his career as a prophet. It becomes his touchstone. And the divine presence is the source of it all. So what do we make of all of this? How does Otto's framework shape our view of the divine? In our discussions with those who don't believe in God, we can respond by talking about process theology or Christian existentialism or personal idealism or emergence. But we can also turn to the experience of the divine. The experience is not one that can be easily put into words. Either you have experienced God in some way, or you have not. If you have not, you cannot be convinced of God's existence. You can use philosophy to show how belief in God makes sense, but fundamentally, you must have some experience yourself in order to truly believe. Atheists might say that an experience of the divine is mere fiction. It's something you make up. But for those who have experienced the numinous, the experience itself is self-justifying. For someone who affirms the perspective of Otto, Christian apologetics takes on a different slant. You don't need to argue with those who don't believe in God. Instead, you can encourage someone to explore the divine on their own. You want to know about God? Go visit places of worship. See where people go to be reminded of God's presence. Read through the sacred texts of various faith traditions. Not with a skeptical eye, but with an eye to discover what it's all about. Observe how people of faith live out their response to God's presence in their life. What do they do? They worship their creator. They serve others. They try to exhibit love and compassion. Why? What propels it? It's the divine presence. Discover it for yourself. Arguments won't convince anyone. Only Newman can do that. And experiencing the Newmanist in a profound way will be life-changing. Now, one more thing should be noted. Most of us have not had experiences of God that are like Isaiah's. (laughs) Rarely do we experience God in such an overpowering and all-encompassing way. Most of us only catch glimpses of it. We experience it enough to be convinced it is real and to be fascinated by it, but we cannot claim to be mystics or prophets. But it is significant to own the experiences that we have had. When have you had an experience of the numinous. What was it like for you? Can you name those experiences, those moments? Have you ever tried to write them down or put them into words? Once we can own these experiences and validate them as real and worthy, we can then take the next step to seek them out more authentically. And that is one thing that we try to do in places like FCC. We want to create space for worship and for living lives of faith. Where you can be instruments of, where can you be instruments of service and justice? Where can you meditate, pray, and explore the divine presence? What pilgrimages might help you to learn and experience more? We only get one life, or at least one that we know of. How can we make sure that we use that life to deepen our faith and make our time with God life-changing? Next week begins Holy Week, the most sacred time of the year for Christians. It's a time when we can and should explore the heart of the faith. The ancient celebrations of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter help structure our faith, wade into those experiences, 
embrace this time of year. Open yourself up to the divine that we find in the story of Jesus. We need Holy Week this year as much as any other year. Let it change you so that we can proclaim the great work of God here on earth together. Let us rediscover once more the power of the numinous.